Singing Dutchman Productions. Hello and welcome to Doug's Front Porch, a podcast where I get to sit down with friends, old and new, and have honest conversations. Today, I welcome one of my newer friends, Tara Mondock, onto the front porch. Tara, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to have you on because you have a really cool story to tell, and we'll get to that a little later in the interview, but I like to start every episode off the same way so my audience gets to know you a little bit better. Could you tell us where you were born and a little bit about your childhood? Did you have brothers and sisters? What kind of things were you into as a kid to let us get an idea of what young Tara was like? Oh, uh, yeah. So I, I was born and raised in Tampa, Florida. Um, I am the only girl. I have three brothers. I'm in the middle. I'm next to the youngest. Um, so um, I grew up in uh, in Tampa. I very I, I actually didn't leave, uh, you know, Tampa for my entire life until I would never left the state of Florida until I was 18 years old when I left for college. So I spent all of my life uh, reared there. And uh, so I'm a Florida girl at heart, um, although I have fallen in love with Pennsylvania. So. Uh, yeah, that's me as a child. I grew up um, playing sports. I loved softball. I played basketball. Um, yeah, just all around. I love to be outside. Yeah. So I have to ask you, being the the only the only daughter with three sis with three brothers, what did, did they have a big influence on you? Were you kind of like, did you have to, uh, you know? I, it sounds like, you know, you were outdoorsy and you played athletic, you did athletics. So it doesn't sound like you were a, a girly girl, so to speak, where you compete, were you competing with your brothers all the time? Oh gosh. You know, I, I had, um, I wouldn't say I was competing with them so much. They have a heavy fluid. They looked out for me for sure. Um, my mom was a, a single mom and, um, and so we had, you know, we didn't have a lot growing up. And so, uh, we made the best of what we had, um, worked with what we had. And, uh, and so, so that was our, our childhood was, you know, we lived on, um, you know, we lived within our means. Let's just say that we didn't have anything extra. It was, um, so I was, uh, the only one actually that went off to college. My other three brothers didn't. So, um, or my, my brothers didn't. So that's, I would say that, um, you know, there's, uh, they are all living in Florida and, and then around the same areas where we grew up. So, um, so I would say I sort of left, I flew the coop and, um, and I, uh, I spent the first, the first, um, 10 years of my marriage actually down in, in Tampa. And then we made the move to, to Pennsylvania. So, uh, I have become a Pennsylvania girl, uh, through, through that transition. So, well, can I go back? Uh, you said you, you left Tampa to to go to college. Where did where did you yeah. go to school? So I went to college at Western Carolina University, um, which is in the heart of uh, of Cullowhee, um, North Carolina, the south side of Silva, where Deliverance was filmed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a dry county, not a whole lot there uh, to do, but I loved it. I um, I was in the marching band. Um, I enjoyed. Um, you know, the connections I made with people in college that I still enjoy to this day. What, what did you study? So I, I have a, a major in marketing and a minor in journalism. OK, so I have to ask you, as that young girl going off to college, what what drew you to marketing and journalism? Oh, gosh, you know, um, I didn't have a lot of guidance, to be honest. I went with a really generic business degree thinking that I could, you know, I would be trained my advisor and. Uh, the folks I looked up to in, in college, many of my professors um, kind of drew me to a really general degree that I could then utilize in any way I wanted in a career that I get to choose. So, um, you know, I, I my training uh, is sort of, I meandered a little bit. Um, so, you know, I have a marketing degree and a minor in journalism. I love to write. I love to read. Um, and I, I love to connect with people. So I, I think that sort of represents what I picked up and learned and used in the skill sets through college and, and life still to this day. 
So you mentioned already that you've, you you moved around a lot, uh, you know, with your husband and you were in Florida, then you were in North Carolina, then you went back to Florida. And I, you spent some time in, in Kansas City, correct, as well? I did. Yes, I did. I actually, um, I, I grew up with this company I went to work for uh, just out of college. I took a job with IBM down in Tampa uh, and then had the opportunity through uh, one of their larger partners to um, travel quite a bit with my work. And a lot of my travel took me here to um, near and around the Northeast. And so I uh, I moved with Marty, my husband, to uh, Pennsylvania um, and, and had the opportunity to travel with my work um, then as well. And then it became a national uh, territory. So it was really a great opportunity for me to be a little closer to home while I did a lot of that travel. Yeah. So today and I looked you up on LinkedIn because I wanted to get your exact title correctly. Uh, so today you are the associate director of client relations at Penn State Extension. So what's that mean? <laughs> what, yeah. what, what, what do you do? And, and please, for the, yeah, for the audience, too, that might not be aware of most people are familiar with Penn State, Penn State University, of course, this massive, this massive university that's here in Pennsylvania. But they might not know what the extension is like Penn State Extension. Could you could you briefly explain what Penn State Extension is first, what they do and then tell us about your job? Absolutely. So I uh, I work for Penn State, the university. We are the land grant here in Pennsylvania. Um, I work more specifically for Penn State Extension, which is the extension portion of the land grant uh, mission. So research, teaching, extension. Um, and so as a part of my responsibility within extension, I am responsible for positioning the resources and, uh, and expertise we offer at, in each of the 67 counties across the state. So extension is actually a, the non-credit way of uh, lifelong learners kind of pick up and utilize resources in uh, in their communities. So we run programs like 4-H, Master Gardeners, some know us for Master Watershed Stewards for the work we do around water quality. We do a lot of work with um, with with adult learners around nutrition education. Um, and so economic development, we work with industry to uh, look at ways to train up workforce. Um, so we touch every Pennsylvania and uh, every Pennsylvania in some way. Uh, which is a really neat um, opportunity for uh, for ex for extension and the people we get to serve. So, what is your role specifically uh, in client relations? Like, what's your what's your day look like? What do you have? What do you do? Yeah, yeah. I am. I I actually am the uh, associate director of client relations. In that role, I lead the team of client relations, uh, which is really a community relations uh, role um, in each of the sixty seven counties. We have responsibility for uh, securing our funding, uh, and so we position the work that we do with our funders, with our advocates who help us to secure our funding, um, both in the county and at the state and federal levels. And so, uh, so we're responsible for those community relations, uh, the relationships that we have both locally uh, at the at the regional level, and then to at the state and federal levels. So we work very closely. Yeah. I think a lot of Pennsylvanians have no idea that what the extension all offers. It's truly unbelievable. And like you said, every county has an extension office, all 67 counties within the state. Um, yeah, Master Gardener, I think, is probably what people maybe know the best. But I, as you were listing some of those things, I didn't know that you did stuff with like nutritional education for uh, you know adults. I had no idea that the extension office did that type of stuff. If, if some... If somebody wants to like access and, and learn more about their county extension office, that simply is going onto the website and it'll list, you know, what 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 services or programs they have available. Yeah, so you can visit our website at extension.psu.edu, and that will actually open you up to where you can do a search for a specific um, term you're looking for, more resource or expertise around. We have pubs, we have webinars you can look at, how-to videos, um, and so there's a ton of resources there for all sorts of topic. So uh, that's the best way to get connected. You can also opt in so that if you have an area of interest like gardening, you mentioned that, or youth development, you can actually opt in for uh, for those areas of interest and you'll get information delivered right to your inbox. So there's a way to do that rather than having to come to the website every time to find out what new programs we're offering or more resources we have available. Okay, fellow Pennsylvanians that are listening to this podcast, check out your local extension office through Penn State, and you might you might be surprised what you can find and what you can take advantage of. Um, 
that was really interesting. I, I learned some stuff, Tara. Thanks so much. There's some stuff I didn't know there. Um, but the, the real reason I wanted to have you on the podcast is to tell another aspect of your life and something that you're very active in. Uh, and I, I want to give voice to this, to my audience, but also, um, just to let people know that this is something that's out there. And in order to kind of like breach into this conversation, we do have to talk about an organization that both you and I do belong to. Uh, and there's probably people listening to this conversation that when we mention the Eastern star or the order, of the Eastern star, maybe their thoughts of, Oh, I think my grandmother was one of those, or oh, I think I remember hearing about them at some point, but I don't know what they are. So let's give the elevator pitch and I'm going to turn it over to you. What is the order of the Eastern star? So Pennsylvania Order of the Eastern Star is um, is an organization. It's a fraternal, a co-ed fraternal organization. Um, and it's, uh, it is it is a Masonic, we call it an independent body, meaning you have to have a relationship with or be related to a Mason in order to be eligible to join. Um, it is an organization that's charitable. Uh, we do a lot of community work. Um, we Many come to the Order of the Eastern Star because they have that Masonic foundation somewhere in their family line. But I will tell you, my my husband did not. Um, he actually became a Mason when I joined the Order of the Eastern Star. And together, we're actually uh, serving in the Order of the Eastern Star, and he still serves in what we call the Blue Lodge, the, the Masonic Lodge. So we're, um, you know, it's where, again, it's co-ed, men and women belong. Um, it's an organization that not just there's chapters that there's 96 chapters here in Pennsylvania. We have just under uh, 15,000 members um, in every nook and cranny across the state. So in those 96 chapters, um, they kind of roll up to our uh, Grand Lodge or Grand Chapter here in Pennsylvania. And that uh, Pennsylvania uh, uh, Grand Chapter actually is a part of an international order as well. So it is. Uh, a very large um, network. It's the largest fraternal organization in the world. Um, and it continue, we continue to do uh, good things with, through missions that are charities that we support both here in the state and internationally. Um, and so it's a chance for us to really be in community with one another. And I do often hear that, um, Doug, it's, you know, the, it's, this is not your grandmother's fraternity. Uh, right. It's not your grandmother's sorority. This is not just the ladies. It's really an active organization that um, many come to because they want to make a difference in their community. And so uh, so my worlds often come together with Penn State Extension and, um, you know, the the work that we do with Pennsylvania Order of the Eastern Star. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the organiz uh, the the uh, initiatives I know we support as an example, uh, one of the charities is Alzheimer's. Right. Um, and so I have information available through Penn State Extension that um, allows caregivers who you know struggle with uh, providing care for those that are challenged with caring for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. And so that's an opportunity for us to do outreach and take that information out to the general public and support the work um, in the community to to uh, to uh, to address needs like that. Um, so really quickly, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, that sounds like an organization I, I might be interested in, just so that everyone's clear and you you can research Eastern Star, you can look them up online and stuff. And there's a there's a Pennsylvania page. And and as Tara said, it's not just Pennsylvania. It's all across the United States and, and internationally as well. But in case anyone is really interested in thinking about looking into this and interested in possibly joining, there is there's like there's one caveat that you need to have involved uh, in order to be a member. And if you could just highlight for anybody that's listening, if they're thinking about this in order to become a member of the Eastern Star, what does that process look like? Yeah, so you would need to have an affiliation or a, a relationship with the uh, with the Mason. Um, and so my grandfather, for example, was a Shriner. He was a Mason. My uncle was a, a Mason. And so through that, I became eligible to join the Pennsylvania Order of the Eastern Star. So you just have to have a, a, a connection to uh, to the Masonic organization, or you need to be affiliated with or have uh, been, belong to a youth organization like Rainbow uh, Girls or um, Rainbow International or Job's Daughters, those youth organizations are DMLA, um, so that you have that youth connection, uh, many of which are connected to uh, folks that are also a Mason. So, so those will also be a, 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 a way to be, be eligible. 
I like that. I like how you said it's not your grandmother's Eastern star anymore. Uh, we, I, you know, for some people who might have had some connection, maybe it was their grandmother was in a group like this, or it doesn't have to be Eastern star. It could be maybe name any other fraternal organization, the Elks, the the you know whatever. Uh, I think. We have these and I've had I've, I've had other guests on the podcast that we've talked about fraternal organizations and the role that they play in our society and how most people don't realize how much work they do. Uh, they're not just a building, you know, downtown and they people dress up in funny hats or they wear a, a white dress. It's way more than that. Um, and what I love about what you bring to the organization is even though you're not 20 years old, you do bring a sense of youth and energy and vitality to an organization that for generations has been a little old and dusty so to speak but i do see changes happening as 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 you know what's going on re you know within the re last couple of years and particularly in what we're going to talk about here in a little bit and your and the service dog project but i want to ask you one question before we move into that and so you've been a member of this organization now for a couple of years for, for multiple years what do you personally get out of belonging to eastern star good question so for me i joined um the order of the eastern star 10 years ago um, and it's an opportunity for me as I trans, as my kids grew up, you know, I have 21 year old twin girls and my son's uh, 28. So, you know, we, our time freed up, right? We wanted to figure out how we could give back to community. All the things that we did before that were with and for our kids and being in community through scouting, through our church, through the sports um, that they did in the, uh, as they were growing up. And so we needed to find something else to invest our time in where we could make a difference. And so for me, I my grandmother was also, oddly enough, in, uh, in Pennsylvania or in Eastern Star down in Florida. My grandfather, we grew up going to the circus with the uh, uh, Shriners, right? Um, and so for me, those were memories that I, I thought back, like, maybe I'll try that out. And, and then through that uh, organization, like getting connected, um, we had some opportunities to really support some charities. Um, and then I... And then I, I really started to get, uh, I fell in love with the, the service dog uh, work that we do as part of that mission. So, so what do I get to do is I really get to make a difference in the community and I get to see that difference in so many different ways. Um, and so for me, that, that shows up in my, at work, it shows up for me at home, it shows up for me in my uh, family and in my community. And so it's, it, it makes me feel like I can make a difference. I think the one thing too that is often overlooked because I guess we just don't think about it, but joining any kind of any organization like this, whether it's the Eastern Star or the Masons or the Elks, is that it puts us into contact with so many different people in our own community that we would never come into contact with. Everybody, you know, that that runs the gamut of white collar to blue collar to retired to executive to and and you are in company with these people and you become a community yourself within that group. And I think all too often nowadays, we, you know, we retreat to our bubbles because we can, because it's so easy to do that, whether it's the social media that we, that we consume, or, you know, we only hang out with our close friends because that's our close friend circle. And very rarely do we, do we be pushed in society? Do we get pushed into situations where we have to interact with people that are not the same as us? And these organizations I find forces us to do that in in a good way and creates community but also broadens our own perspectives of who else is in my greater community that you never maybe would give two thoughts about right um i don't that's been my experience at least belonging to groups like this i don't know if you found that with eastern star or not but i think that's one of the huge benefits in a in a world where we are constantly retreating because we're able to and this forces being parts of organizations like this forces us to do the exact opposite and push out and get into, you know, get into community with people. And, and then we can take those skills, like you said, and then take them to the broader community beyond our, our organizations as well. Yeah. That's a really um, fascinating perspective because, you know, I hadn't thought about how diverse we are. Um, you know, yes, we, we have people from all ages and all walks of life that are members of, of our chapter and that we get to interact with as we venture out to other chapters and as we come together at our grand chapter statewide, um, you know, when we gather um, annually. So, so yes, there are people from all walks that I would never see, have the opportunity to engage with if I weren't a member. Um, and I've learned a lot from them. I've learned a lot. I walk, and, and the other thing I get to do as a member is I, I'm walking in the footsteps of my 
of my of our founding fathers, right? I am walking literally the same and saying the same ritual, performing the same things that they did in in their chapters when we founded this country. And so it's kind of a neat thing to be able to to know that you have a connection that goes back so far. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, and and it gives me a chance to really there's a lot of lessons and um and kind of ritual that's rooted that means something um if you really study and invest the time to do it. Um, it's not just words you recite as part of the ritual. It really is. You know, our five heroines as part of our star points represent the daughters, the widows, uh, the wives, the sisters, and the mothers. We all fall in some, one of those uh, points in, in some point in our life. And so there's a lesson that's biblically oriented that we get to tell over and over again, and we draw more people into it. It is a community. It is that we all come from different, and not all of us have kids. Not all of us, um, you know, have, have uh, you know, the, the, but we're mothers to each other, right? We're mothers to, I have mothers in my chapter because I don't, my mother's gone. And so there's a, it's a really great chance for us to make connection I would not otherwise have had. Um, and so I appreciate that. I appreciate the perspective they bring um, and, and, and the things that we get to do together um, serving in the community. Um, and I hope to do more of that. Yeah. Well, we already mentioned this, but let's transition to this part of the conversation, which was really the main reason I wanted to have you on. You already made mention that, you know, the Eastern Star has various charitable things that they do. But one thing that the that Pennsylvania's Eastern Star particularly uh, does is called the Service Dog Project. So let's talk about that. What uh, Explain what that is. And then I have some follow up questions for you, Tara. Yeah, absolutely. So so 20 years ago, we have a 20 year history. Um, we uh, brought the service dog mission to Pennsylvania uh, through some wonderful work of those people that went before me. Um, but what we get to do is raise money. Uh, we fundraise, we do outreach, we share what the power of a service dog can do and, and giving independence um, and sometimes a second chance at life for people that need it. And, and a service dog can be partnered with anyone from any walk in any age. And so everything from a veteran to a child with disabilities to a mental health to a facility that that they might be able to take advantage of. So there's service dogs serve so many purposes and I've seen them in so many different places. Um, and again, I fall in love with the mission. So it's, it's an opportunity for us um, as Pennsylvania Order of the Eastern Star to fundraise and do outreach to share the important work that the service dog mission means for people that get uh you know to to benefit from that so it's not necessarily that these members of the eastern star are raising the puppies and training them it's more that you guys are raising money to keep these organizations that are raising the puppies that are training the dogs to to keep those to keep that that side of the equation functioning so we actually do have some uh we surround the the raisers um, and and those people that sort of breed and we call it whelp or, or take care of the mom and the puppies when they're born, um, the raisers that take them the first 18 months of their life and the advanced training, we surround them with support. Um, we could be puppy sitters. We could be raisers. Um, we could be doing outreach with them to help share the things that they're doing to encourage more people to become sitters and raisers. So that outreach is important because that organization is very much volunteer. That organization, Susquehanna Service Dogs is our partner. Um, they're located in Grant, Grantville, uh, Pennsylvania, just outside of Harrisburg. Um, and we do our, our, uh, our work with them in supporting financially. The fundraising we do goes to them primarily. Um, and so, so we surround them with the support they need to, to raise those dogs and partner them with, uh, with their human partner. And then beyond that, even right, those partners are, and the, 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 uh, teams are supported by Susquehanna service dogs throughout the life of that dog. Um, and so, so the work that we do continues beyond even them being paired and trained, um, and, and, you know, moving out, they come back to get recertified and, um, and to care for them as a team um, throughout the life of that, the life cycle of that dog. So it's important work. We start from the moment that that dog is, takes its first, is, is actually bred um, to it, when it takes its last breath. 
we are we are supporting surrounding them with support that enables that entire um, process for uh, for for the dog and for the human partner that gets to um, share in the joy that that dog brings to them. In a previous conversation that you and I had, uh, you you talked about this, and I learned some things, and I kind of felt stupid afterwards because going into our conversation, I knew about the service dog project. I didn't know a lot about it, but I was I was familiar that it existed, you know. And there was this there was this mindset that I had that you know if I think of a service dog, and maybe this is the case for a lot of people, I don't know, but I always you know my mind goes right away. Oh, it's a blind person that has a dog that helps them see. And that was, you know, that was always the stereotype that I had in my mind. But then after that conversation you and I recently had, you completely threw those, <laughs> threw those blinders off of me and said, Oh no, no, there's so many more things get like the one thing you already kind of mentioned, but to talk a little bit more about a lot of these service dogs get partnered up with veterans. So explain that. And, and why are veterans getting partnered up with dogs? Yeah, so we uh, we actually have a member that's uh, uh, in Pennsylvania Order of the Eastern Star on the western side of the state who has a service dog, and he told his story um, at um, a couple years ago at our grand chapter, um, and it moved me so much. That's when I was completely in. Like I I knew that this was this is where I was meant to be to make a difference. Um, struggle with PTSD, and he told his story, um, and and two weeks before he came to this event. Um, you know, he sat on his bed and he, you know, he was struggling and, and the dog sensed it, the dog would alert and he moved over, um, the dog moved closer to him and he opened the bedside drawer. He told the story of pulling his um, handgun out and setting it on the, on the bedside, uh, you know, uh, on the side of his bed, the dog came over and came between him and the, and the handgun. And then he, you know, he, he moved the handgun over on his lap and he told the story about how the dog moved over to his, uh, his lap. And so that dog saved his life that night. And, and he told the story and there was not a dry eye in the place. Everyone was connected to, um, the value that dog brought. And, and the dog is like a, is like a mascot for us. Her name is Jasmine, Jasmine star. Um, she goes everywhere he goes. Um, and he, she stands for so much for us. That's like a constant reminder for us. It's not just veterans that struggle with PTSD. There's tra uh, trauma that happens to people where they need that support. There's balanced dogs. There's hearing dogs. There are, are um, veterans that come back with prosthetics. You know, my very first um, graduation I went to, it's called a leash handoff ceremony. Um, I arrived. It's my very first time. I didn't know what to expect. I got out of the car and I witnessed this woman getting out of the car. She stood up um, and her dog was right there with her. Um, and across the parking lot, she saw a gentleman that had two prosthetic legs. He was wearing shorts. So it was very clear he had prosthetic legs and his dog was there um, by his side. And the two looked at each other and they, they made their way across the parking lot and hugged. And they said, do you realize the last time that we saw each other was in partner training and they're both in wheelchairs. And now they stand and they stand with their dogs and they just stood there with, you know, the most uh, pure emotion. And I thought, this is why I do what I do. This is what I came for. And it just, again, solidified for me the difference I get to make and putting a dog with a person like that, that can now stand and walk. And the life, uh, the second chance that that gave for that veteran that came back with, you know, so much trauma and I'm sure his fair share of PTSD without Without his legs, he can now stand and walk. And he said, this dog is my life. This is my lifeline. Um, and so for me, that was, uh, that's why I do what I do. That's why I put my whole heart in um, and fall, I fell in love with the, with the mission because I know I can make a difference for so many, um, you know, through the work we get to do. Do you know off the top of your head with your involvement, how many, how many dogs you guys have fostered out or like as an estimate? I do not know that number, okay. but I will know that number by by June, I promise. Um, when we go to Grand Chapter, I will cite that because over the last 20 years, Pennsylvania Order of the Eastern Star has raised $655,000 for Susquehanna service dogs. Um, and that's, you know, that is that during that period of time, that wasn't the only charity we were raising money for. Um, but our goal um, this year and going into next year We've set a pretty audacious goal. We're gonna we're gonna raise a hundred thousand dollars this year and a hundred thousand dollars next year, um, and this year for our twentieth anniversary, our you know celebrate our twenty year history with Susquehanna service dogs. We have the 
most awesome opportunity to name a letter. Um, and this was a dream of mine because I, I really, um, you know, I, I thought what better way to connect our mission with the service dogs than to carry our, our, our members, uh, have them connect with and have them be able to tell the story through our, the dogs that are bred and partnered and trained. And then, and then we get to follow them the rest of their life. And so this for us was a st stepping off point and honoring the rest of the, what we can create in that history with this next litter. So um, we named them, they're the SSD Eastern Star Litter. So SSD stands for Susquehanna Service Dogs. Um, and we had five girls and one boy. And so we named them SSD, um, each of their names start with SSD, Ruth, Esther, Martha, um, Naomi, Tyler and star. And so each of those three of those are our star points. One, of course, star is, uh, is named after Eastern star. Um, but the other two are really personal for, for us as a family. Um, Tyler is my son. We spelled it T I L E R because it's a position in lodge in, in, uh, the Masonic lodge. And so we want to use this as a connection for the, the Masons to also understand what important work we're doing with the veterans and other, um, you know, human partners that get to get paired with these dogs too. So they'll get to follow Tyler um, in particular, but the last um, dog we named was Naomi. And Naomi is really special for us because we named her in honor of our granddaughter who we lost in March. And so it's Tyler's daughter. Um, and again, we get a chance for her legacy to live on um, and to make that connection and difference for somebody in her memory, which no greater honor. Naomi is also tied to the Book of Ruth and one of our star points. So it was really special for us to be able to do that um, and to share in the good that that's going to bring to someone. If someone listening to this podcast says, well, I don't have any desire to join the Eastern Star, but this this charity is something that I believe in, is can can they make donations through the Susquehanna Service Dogs website or how would that work if somebody wanted to donate to this charity? Absolutely. So, uh, so we we actually do um, fundraise for Susquehanna service dogs, and all the money goes to Susquehanna. So you can follow us. We often have our um, the Susquehanna service dog links go to the puppy cam, so you can watch the puppies that we just talked about. Um, but also, um, you can give your time in becoming a puppy raiser. You can become a give your time in hosting an outreach event. Um, or you can give your money, your your treasure um, through that same link. So you would probably be better to follow us and then we can lead you to the Susquehanna Service Dog links. Um, you can find us on Facebook at uh, PAOES Service Dog Project, or you can go to our website at paoes.org. Uh, and that, that, yeah. I will put links in the show notes for anybody that uh, wants to learn more and check out the puppy cam because that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I'll have those links, people, if, you, if you'd like to learn more about Eastern Star, but also about this service dog project. And if you would be ever willing to donate money to this, this very fine cause, uh, you know, we talked about how these dogs can be used for veterans, but I, also children. I know you had mentioned that too in, in our conversation, children with disabilities. Um, you know, I, in the high school that I work at over the years, we have had students who've come in with service dogs, um, some kids that are struggling with anxiety and depression, and they had their yes. service dog with them. And that, there probably were other reasons too, but that was, that's one, that's one student I can think of off the top of my head that had their dog. And, uh, that student was in my classes and every day for a year, uh, I had a black lab that would come in to come into class and perfectly behaved. The, the girl would sit down at her desk the dog would come in and just lay on the floor right next to her. And there were days where I forgot there was a dog in the room, to be honest. Uh, so I've I had personal connection to this to this story as well in, in a couple different ways. But um, yeah, I think uh, I mean, the work you guys are doing is just unbelievable. I wasn't aware six hundred thousand dollars over the years. That's amazing. Uh, and, you know, a lofty goal of one hundred thousand dollars this year. But I think if anybody's going to able to is, is able to do it, Tara, I think you are the cheerleader that can make that 
that re that dream come a reality. So I really, I hope it can happen. I really hope it can happen. Tara, this, it's absolutely fascinating conversation. I'm so glad that I had you on and you were able to tell this story to let people know that there are things out there that, you know, these fraternal organizations. And again, I think all too often people from my generation, especially a, they, they don't either. They don't know about it or don't care about it or just, just, you know, this fact that they just don't know that these opportunities are out there for people to get involved in things. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that we can tell these stories. And hopefully, you know, even if you get one new member out of it or somebody that at least uh, throws a couple bucks at the at the at the charity, well, we you know, it's a small victory uh, as we can continue to to make momentum and move forward. So I, I want to applaud you and, and all of the members of the local chapter that are doing the hard work that they're doing to make this this uh, this charity run well and be successful and bring, like you said, a, a second chance to some people, like literally a second chance at life. That's just, it's, 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 how do you put that into words, right? You know, what that what that is and what that means. Um, so I want to thank you for all of that, Tara. But thank at you. the end of the end of every conversation on the podcast here, I ask all my guests. So we've done the serious. The serious business is done. We, we had our conversation. But I like to ask all of my guests 10 quick questions that have nothing to do with anything that we've talked about tonight, but just an opportunity to get to know Tara Mondock a little bit better. Uh, are you ready for your 10 quick questions? Oh, uh, yeah. You're going to be fine. Trust me. All right. Okay. Question number one. What is your morning drink of choice? Oh, coffee. How do you take your coffee? I like it with Splenda and my, I vary my, uh, my flavored um, creamer okay. um, based on the season. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you, uh, do you hit the pumpkin spice hard in the fall? I do. <laughs> okay. I do. Sometimes I do it. They, nowadays they have pumpkin spice and the uh, mocha, peppermint mocha available just about all year long. Yeah. So how I about get, it? I get that treat. It's awesome. <laughs> there, you, there you go. All right. Number two, who is a go-to musical artist for you? Oh goodness. I I very Chris Tomlin is one of my favorite Christian Chris contemporary Tomlin. Christian music uh, okay. musicians. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with him. I'll have to check his yeah. stuff out. Okay. Question number 3. What movie can you watch over and over again and it never gets old? Oh gosh. Shall shake. Oh, what a great answer. Absolutely. That is a popular answer on this podcast. A lot of people have given Shawshank Redemption as an answer for that. Yes. Okay. Because it's a great film. Yeah. All right. Question number four. What is the last thing that you read? Oh, my goodness. Um, good to great. Good okay. To great. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a, a fiction, a work of fiction or something? No, else? it's a leadership file. I, I'm a, I'm a, I typically pick up a book just to kind of brush up on leadership skills. So good to greats one. I also follow a lot of uh, Simon Sinek's work. Okay. So leadership, yeah, to professional development. I, I'm constantly blown away at the amount of, of literature out there that is geared towards how to make someone a, a good leader or a better leader. And I wonder, is there really a leadership crisis in our society that... <sighs> So many yeah. people write about this and you're in leadership. Uh, can we just I, I want to ask you about that real quick. What? Why do you think that is? Why is there so much stuff out there for leadership? I think um, I honestly think leadership can be lonely. Sometimes you just need perspective. There's not always a safe, good, safe place to kind of get your perspective. And so it becomes difficult to like pick up on tips and tricks if you uh, if you're, you know, in an organization surrounded by people that expect you to be that that like dynamic leader. So I think you go where you can get that. And sometimes it's, I, I do a lot of driving. So for me, I listen to a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, when you ask, that's why I hesitate when you ask me what I read last. It's like, <laughs> what did I listen to last? <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I listen to a lot of Simon Sinek because he gives me so much perspective. Um, yeah. Okay. I was often curious about that. Okay, great. Uh, number five, what is your favorite pizza topping? Oh my goodness. I, I'm I'm easy. I'm pepperoni. I'm okay. pepperoni and cheese girl. <laughs> Sounds good. Number six, laying on the beach or going for a hike? Ooh, I kind of like both. Okay. If you had to pick go, one, though, you had to pick one. For, I would go for a hike. Okay. When you where you grew up in Florida, you said outside the Tampa area. Were were you a beach girl growing up? Did you go to the beach a lot? Not a lot. We went to Clearwater. That was our beach of choice. But but it's um yeah, it, it gets hot, hot down there. That's why I'm not I don't spend a lot of time on the beach. So that's why I would rather go for the hike. Sounds good. Uh, or ride your motorcycle. Right. We didn't even talk yes. about that. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, uh, Tara is a fellow BMW rider. Uh, good, yes. good choice. Good choice. Uh, number seven, you have invited me over for dinner. What are you making? Oh, we have a pretty good, um, I, I make herb chicken, herb okay. chicken and pasta dish. So that's probably what I would, would be my go-to. Sounds good. Sounds good. I'm not a picky eater. So <laughs> almost anything that's put in front of me, I will enjoy. Uh, question number eight, what is a dream vacation destination? Oh, boy. So Marty and I have planned uh, one of our bucket list items, which is uh, the Badlands going up oh. to, um, you know, up to Mount Rushmore and then out um, across the Badlands. So I'm looking forward to experiencing that with him in August. It, oh, you're doing that this August. That's yes. awesome. I'll tell you what, I I did it on the motorcycle and the Badlands are completely underrated. The, most people like it, it was I didn't know what to expect. And then as we were riding through them, that's when I had like that light bulb moment. Like oh. this is absolutely ridiculously beautiful. And there yeah. was nobody there. So you felt like you had the whole state to yourself almost. Yeah. You're going to love it. You will absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Looking forward to that. Uh, number nine. What's something you're afraid of? Hmm. I don't do snakes. <laughs> and me I'm really either. afraid of heights. Oh, like I'm okay. super afraid of heights. So that for me is probably a, a notch above the, the snakes. So the, the heights thing really gets me. So a snake on a ladder would be double jeopardy, right? Or something like wow. that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Last question for you. What job other than one that you've had, would you love to have? Uh, you know, I I think um, I always dreamed of being a wedding coordinator. <laughs> okay. And so I, you know, I I just think there's something um, amazing about about managing the transformation of a day for a person to make it mm. like it's the wedding coordinator for me would just be awesome. Yeah. I used to cater in in high school, and so I got a little taste of that. But really, just doing the whole shebang would be amazing. Yeah. Well, Tara, it has been an absolute pleasure, and and I'm so glad that you decided to do this and come on and, and tell your story to my audience, and uh, I just want to thank you for coming on and agreeing to do this. You have a great story to tell, and I hope that people that are listening take something from this and say, I want to learn more, or I want to donate, or you know, whatever, how, whatever moves them, um, but I want to thank you, Tara. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for listening to Doug's Front Porch a conversational podcast with your host, Doug Maidenford. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Your ratings and reviews will help others find the show. You can follow along on Facebook, X, and Instagram. Just look for Doug's Front Porch. If you would like to financially support our endeavors, there's a Buy Me a Coffee link in the show notes. I thank you in advance for any contributions. Please feel free to tell all your friends about the show, and I'll see you all next time on My Front Porch. Music